Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, may his peace and blessings be with you now and always. Please now join me in prayer as we come before our Lord. Holy Father, we give thanks to you that you have made each of us clean through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray now that as we do uh, hear the words of, of, your, of the sermon, as we hear this text, that we consider all the, all the ways that you have prepared us to share your love with others. Break down the barriers that have formed between us. Break down those barriers that we may, fo- that we may joyfully and gladly share your good news with all those we meet. This we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Many of you, even if you have not traveled too far, have had the chance to try different cuisines. Maybe as you think about the different cuisines you've tried, you can think about one that we have here in the Imperial Valley that I would say is unique in many ways, and that is carne asada. If you go to Los Angeles or if you go to San Diego, you can get carne asada, don't get me wrong, but it doesn't taste like it does here. By my opinion, I like it here, but they're certainly to each their own. But as you know, even if you've traveled just a little bit, you know that cuisines change. When Carla and I went on Vicarage on my third year of seminary, or my internship year, we had an eye-opening experience. We had a new cuisine that we'd never tried before. Here, this Midwestern boy and young lady were going to Louisiana, southern Louisiana, Baton Rouge, where they had such food as shrimp po'boys, etouffee, Sausage gumbo. Well, we were willing to be adventurous and try these things, and I have to say, after about 15, 20 pounds, we learned how much we enjoyed these things. But You know, there's one thing that sticks out in my mind more than any of the other things we ate while we were on Vicarage, and that is crawfish bowls. And i got to tell you, those crawfish bowls, those were delicious. If you've ever seen a crawfish, you know that they look like a miniature lobster, but they aren't. They're bottom feeders. They're, if, if you actually saw what they eat and, what they, and how they eat, you'd be grossed out. But crawfish bowls, you know, as we had those, we discovered, well, there's a process, of course. First, you have to drop those crawfish into water while they're still alive. Salt water, so that it makes them evacuate all the nasty stuff that's inside them to get, out of, get it out of them. Well, then after that, then you do that a couple more times. Then you drop them into a pre-prepared boiling pot. And in that boiling pot, well, actually, you put them in a little cage and put them in there. And before you uh, put them in there, then, you uh, have to make sure you spice it and putting in potatoes and uh, cauliflower, things like that. Our friend Stephen put in pineapple as well. And then after about 10 minutes after you put the lid on, you pull them out, and then you get to eat them. And if you've ever been, never been to a crawfish bowl, then you'll discover that, well, it sounds very disgusting the way you eat them. It's actually quite tasty. What you do is you pinch the tail, pull the head off, and then you eat the meat, and then you proceed to suck the juices out of the head because they're so tasty. And I noticed Crystal's nodding there, so of course I, we, we learned well then. But, you know, as I, as I bring that up today, uh, it reminds me of our text from Acts chapter 11. And not just because uh, there wouldn't be a Louisiana crawfish bowl had Acts 11 not happened, but more importantly, because of what God did in Acts chapter 11. He broke down barriers. There's one particular verse that I want to call your attention to. It's in your bulletin there. And if you go back to verse 9 with me, the voice spoke from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Or in other words, if God makes it clean, it's clean. See, what this text is about is not allowing for a greater course of dinner. It's not about adding to the menu of the Jewish people. It's not about preparing the people so that they can try new things, new cuisines. But this is about opening the door to the Gentiles. This is about breaking down the barriers. Up to this point, the Gentiles had been kept out of the salvation story. Up to this point, unless you were of the line of Israel, you did not know salvation. At least not salvation through the Lord, and so no salvation. But through this verse, through these words... God opened up salvation. He broke down these barriers. Galatians chapter 3, Paul says it more succinctly and more importantly, that no longer were there any divisions. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. What an important verse, what an important set of verses for us to hear today. Because as, even as Peter heard those verses, 
they weren't necessarily comfortable verses for him to hear. Even as we see, as he's explaining in Acts 11, later in Acts 15, as Luke records, there were those who were Jewish Christians who didn't want to believe that it was by the salvation on the cross alone. But there had to be something more. They had it tied into their circumcision, to their food laws, to their ritual purity. But Jesus had said, no, salvation comes through Christ alone, through me alone. Now this, was not, this assault was not coming from outside the church. These were Jewish Christians who had, had their faith tied up with their own sacrifice. And God needed to break down those barriers so that all would receive that promise of salvation, so that all would hear that message of the promise. And so through Peter, through the other apostles, he brought the gospel message not only to the Jewish people, but to the ends of the earth. And this is so important because even to this day, we know that the gospel message still needs to be shared. We know that the gospel message still needs to be proclaimed. But so often there are barriers that are formed. Some of these barriers are artificial barriers, like our own traditions, our own comforts. Some of these barriers, they're very real barriers. Barriers that have formed because of different lifestyles, economics, language barriers. But it seems to me that those barriers, regardless of whether or not they're artificial, or whether or not they are legitimate, need to be broken down. Because Christ broke down all barriers. He broke down the barriers between Jew and Gentile, between male and female, between any and all, so that all would know that they are saved by that precious blood of the Lamb. So that all would know that this new commandment, that we love one another. Or so often those barriers get in the way, don't they? So often it's a barrier of fear. Maybe it's a, the fear that we have of sharing our faith with others. Maybe it's the fear, of, uh, the, the barrier of economy, as I would mentioned, where it's someone who's just not in our social group, someone we don't regularly run into. Oh, maybe it's that barrier that comes up, that's a, the bar- that language barrier, as I mentioned. But we don't know what, how, how to speak their language, how to share it, and, because they don't speak the way we do. Maybe it is, and I think more often, it's a barrier of apathy. And I don't think that any of you would say that you don't care about those outside the church. But the question that comes to mind is, do we care enough to share the faith? Do we care enough for those outside the church to share God's love with them, to share his message with them? And this is a hard question to ask, because honestly, not only is it a question I direct towards you, but it's one I direct towards me as well. Are we faithful in sharing God's word? Are we faithful in breaking down that barrier of apathy? And too often, not just here, but around the Christian church, we've grown complacent. We've grown complacent, comfortable. God hasn't grown complacent. The law that he gave us, the command that he gave us, that he gave to his disciples, go and make disciples, hasn't changed of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. For surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. One of the last things Jesus said to the disciples, one of the last commands, has not changed. God has not grown complacent expecting us to just sit here and wait for people to come. He has called us to go, to share that gospel message, to proclaim those words and to break down those barriers. And that's a scary thought. It's a scary thought because it means getting out of our comfort zone. It means getting out of where we're used to being and getting out of the way that we're used to being. And it means asking the question, what barriers have I created in my life? And I want to take you just a moment now for, to think about that. What barriers have you created? What barriers have I created that keep me from sharing the gospel message? See, Jesus, he breaks down those barriers. He does, but so often we keep rebuilding them. He knocks down the stones. We put them back on top of one another, keep building it up higher. We talk about wanting to share the gospel message. We know that we need to, but those barriers just are, seem like they're easier to build than to tear down, to break through. And in truth, we've grown comfortable. In truth, when we ask the question, why is the church in decline? Why is organized religion struggling in the world today? It's because that we have grown complacent. We have grown comfortable and we have not been out there sharing 
God's message, proclaiming it and making disciples. And it starts. It starts right here, absolutely. But it doesn't end right here in the church. We are called to go. Because when we go, we are sharing the heart of God. And I think too often we forget what it means to share the heart of God. Because of that fear, because of that apathy, because of those other barriers. We forget that the heart of God is that all people may be saved. The heart of God is for the lost, for the dying. The heart of God is for each of us bottom feeders who eat the garbage and allow ourselves to be filled up with sin. The heart of God is for the rejected, for those no one else wants. The heart of God is for us. And the heart of God is, to share, is meant to be shared with others. And when we don't share that heart of God, we need to seek His forgiveness. We need to come before Him and again see that mercy that He has shown to us. And again hear those words, I forgive you, because as, and as many times as we hear those words, there would never be enough times. We need to hear them again and again so that we might share that heart with others. I told you about the way that you purge a crawfish by putting it in salt and water. Well, God has such a much beautiful, more beautiful method than that. Because instead of salt and water, simple salt and water, the precious blood of His Son He used to purge each of us of our sin, to wash us and to make us clean, to make us whole and new again. So that when we ask, what are the barriers that we have placed that we can also pray that the Lord would break those down in our hearts. That we might seek His great commission to go and to make disciples. Not just to talk about it, but to do it. Not just to think about it, but to go forth. We have that barrier, the back door, that we can break down. But not alone. Did you catch right at the end of that there? This week and next week and as we come to Pentecost, we're constantly reminded that we're not doing this alone. For surely, God is with us to the very end of the age. Surely, God is with us when we go forth. When we're here, when we go to the people, surely we are not doing it alone. But we are doing it with the power of the Holy Spirit. And in that power, there is no weakness. In that power, there is no weakness. And I think it's important we remember that. Because we do so often say, that's another barrier we build up. Is that, well, I just don't know what to say. I wouldn't know who to go to. But in the power of the Holy Spirit, those barriers wash away. Those barriers are completely decimated. And just as we are no longer held back from the, the loving grace of our God, our Father, those barriers that we have to share His love are broken down. And it starts, it starts with prayer. It starts here in the church as we disciple, as we grow together. But it doesn't end with prayer. It starts with our prayers asking the Lord for His discipline, for His guidance in our hearts. It starts with prayers asking that He would have a spirit of timidity, for a spirit of power and a spirit of truth. It starts there, but it doesn't end there. Because then the next step is to go. It is the next step to, to go and to, to proclaim those words. And maybe the first place we go is into our homes to our children and to our grandchildren. We know that it is not the government's job. It is not the world's job to educate our children on what is right and wrong. But it is our job, dear people of God, it is our job to teach our children and grandchildren that message of the gospel, that message of truth. But not only our children and grandchildren, not only our families, but even those outside of our family, those in our communities, standing up for what is right, what God says is right. Standing against what God says is wrong taking a stand for His biblical truths. And that's a scary thought because it may bring about persecution. We're not called to do it though either as, as though we're Bible thumpers beating people over the head. There's a, a group called Westboro Baptists. Fred, Fel Fred Phelps is their pastor who leads them, who gives them direction, and they go into the public squares, they go to military funerals, they go wherever they think they'll get the most coverage, and they shout at people, and they tell them what sinners they are. That is not what God has called us to do. Because we are sinners, and God does not just hate people. 
but he loves people. That is why he sent his son Jesus, because he does indeed hate sin, but he does not hate people. He has, he has not called us to go out into the public square and beat, browbeat people and attack people, but he has called us to go out and to share his love and his mercy, his compassion, to share those same words that we heard. That God loves you. And there's a people out there who needs to hear it. Who needs to hear it. There's a people out there who that is a need they don't even realize, but they need it more than anything else. And we have that message. We have that message of hope, that message of comfort. We have that message. And we have the power of the Holy Spirit that will change hearts and change lives. So I return to that question. What barriers are keeping you from proclaiming God's word? What barriers are there that are keeping you from changing the world and changing hearts for Christ? Whatever those barriers may be, bring them before the Lord. Pray that the Lord will help you to break them down. Pray that the Lord will keep you from building them back up. And pray that the Lord will send you to go and make disciples. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, in this broken world that we live in, we give thanks to you for your suffering death on the cross, for your resurrection, for in your death you have paid the price from our sins, purging us entirely of those sin, sins. By your resurrection you have given us the promised hope that we might be with you one day. Lord, we pray that you would break down the barriers in our lives that separate us from sharing that love from others. We pray that you'd break down those barriers, whatever they may be, that we may, may proclaim that good news, that we may not grow complacent, that we may not grow comfortable, but that we may be invigorated and empowered to proclaim that gospel message and that we may have a heart for your people just as you have had a heart for us. Lord, may we see all people with that heart that brought, that brought to us salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.